All right, you bunch of yahoos, strap yourselves in for another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. In other words, shut up, sit up, and pay attention. And welcome back to another episode of Toxic Masculinity. We are here to entertain, offend, and defend, offer up our political satire approach to views on you know topics uh, on the national and international scene, if that's what we like to do. We will offend and defend offend and defend anybody and everybody we are a couple of crotchy old farts that don't have a, a bad habit of speaking the truth but don't let a few facts get in the way of a good story now no will we'll be folks we believe in america and americans if that's not for you well then i suggest you change the channel now because we still believe in freedom of speech and we'll rub your face into the cow pie of reality we will make you scratch your head and scratch your ass, hopefully not at the same time. Without further ado, my cohort, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Don the Predator Fry, and yours truly, his sidekick, Dan the Beast Severn. And today's guest, a legend in the sport of professional wrestling. I, I probably can't do all the accolades here on the honky tonk man for working for both WCW, WWF, being in WrestleMania three, um, some legendary feuds that you've had with Jake the Snake Roberts and uh, just just countless others. It's going to be a fun and entertaining interview just for Don and myself, just to regale us some of your stories. So, how are we doing here tonight? Mr. Honky Tonk Man. Boy, I tell you what, this is uh, to hear you uh, do that intro and that uh, monologue you had was really something there, uh, <laughs> uh, Dan. You you have, uh, uh, next thing I know, you'll be on uh, uh, MSNBC or CNN or one of those fake news or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, and, 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 but the ironic part was, did, did I ever cut any promos in professional wrestling? Never, because I, that, that was never my, my forte here whatsoever. It's kind of like going, people, I've had more it's people a, like going, you actually talk? Well, yeah, but, I do uh, if I have to, but... Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, I, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you guys, and uh, I've caught some of your stuff along the way in the last few years of, uh, uh, of you guys being on the uh, YouTube channel and everything, and uh, it, it's been interesting to, to listen to it and... Uh, I never met Don before, and this is my first time of uh, uh, communicating, coercing, and uh, saying hello to him. And uh, uh, just listening to some of the things that you and him have talked about over the years on your podcast, uh, I, I know that Don and I would be really good in the car on a long 300-mile road trip because uh, uh, we both kind of uh, are opinionated in our own ways. And uh, uh, I think he's probably would say the same thing. Probably, bro. <laughs> yeah, we'd probably get in trouble. <laughs> but uh, it's been a, you know, it's been a long 47 years for me. Uh, and uh, I, I, if I had to go back and change anything, I wouldn't change anything. I, I'd still do it all the same. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. okay, let's well, start from the beginning. What actually, what actually intrigued you about professional wrestling in the first place? I, I I always wanted to be a, a, I wanted to be in pro sports and entertainment it, since I was like five six years old and uh, and then uh, when I was at the University of Memphis I was at Memphis State and uh, going through my health and physical ed education uh, degree there and some of the boys uh, that I was taking classes with started doing the wrestling but my cousin as some of you might know out there Jerry the King Lawler. His mother and my mother were sisters, and he started in the wrestling business in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, or late 60s, I guess it was, early 70s, and was doing quite well at it. And uh, some of my friends said, hey, he's your cousin. He's doing that, weren't you? And Jerry was never a real athlete. He was an artist. He, he drew pictures and things like that and had an art scholarship to University of Memphis. And I said, okay, I was in the weightlifting team and all that and, and the guy said we work out in Dyersburg Tennessee every Sunday night if you want to go with us and uh, see how you I said okay I'll give it a try I went up there and you know got the crap beat out of me for 
couple hours on a Sunday night by these big uh, 300 pound football players and weightlifters. And uh, one of the kids there that night was Coco Beware, the bird ah. man. And he was training and the big football players and the weightlifters, they all dropped out after a couple of Sunday nights and I stayed, I was hooked. I enjoyed the physical part of it. Uh, I enjoyed, uh, you know, down on the mat and grappling around and all those things. And my trainer was an old time. They weren't, they weren't really shooters back then. Those old timers, you know, like Thez and those guys, they were hookers. And, 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 uh, but I think, was, I think you need to describe what that means here to our <laughs> audience right now, because in today's terminology, it has a whole different meaning. Right now. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's all gone now. But Herb Welch was my trainer. And he trained this guy, Dr. D. David Schultz. You, some of the fans might remember who slapped the TV announcer on uh, NBC TV one night and had a big commotion over that. And and uh, Coco was with me. And But Herb, Herb was part of the Welch family, and the Welches owned all the territories south of the Mason-Dixon line. They owned the Florida part of the Florida territory, Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, and uh, – Herb was the better of all the wrestlers. Four or five of the Welch's fellas. Uh, Roy Welch was a promoter and a wrestler, and Herb was a star wrestler. And some of the, the two other brothers owned territories. But uh, there, Roy Welch had a son named uh, Buddy Fuller. They the Welch's took the Fuller name later on in their in their careers, and then uh, Ron Fuller and Robert Fuller they broke away and started promoting. They were, uh, their uncle trained me, Herb Welch. And Herb was a, not a, they weren't really good down on the mat wrestlers like uh, like you and uh, Dan, like you and Don. And uh, they were the old time hookers where they would hook guys and stretch you and, uh, you know, make you squeal, make you hurt. Yeah, you guys know how to do that, but in amateur wrestling, of course, you can't hook anybody. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> so, right, right. And uh, and uh, Herb taught me not really a lot of the hooking, but he taught me how to protect myself from the hookers, and that's that's how I learned. Because see, in Tennessee, in the seventies and eighties, there was no amateur wrestling except in the private schools. Some of the private mm -hmm. schools, the Catholic schools, they had wrestling and the uh, universities didn't have wrestling. We didn't have wrestling at the University of Memphis. I didn't have it in my high school. They had uh, they got a wrestling team in Memphis. I think it was the year that I graduated in 75 is when they. Uh, so I came along before there was amateur wrestling. But so you to get up you, there, you were, you were pursuing, you had to be a professional athlete. So what, what, what athletics were you going into, though, at, well, you know, at the time? You know, I had started out in, on the football team over there. My mother got sick, had football, cancer, okay. and, and and then I ended up having to drop off of that and and leave that behind. Uh, plus, I wasn't on I wasn't on scholarship, so I was working and trying to do that, which made was it very there certain, Was there a certain position that you were trying out for? I mean, like a, a receiver, or a running back, or and as a, as a freshman, you're just you're put out there as a piece of meat back then. They, it was not oh. like today's. You know, you're you're, you're on a, you, you're on a scout team. You're on the uh, uh, you're on a uh, punt coverage. You're on the kickoff team, and and uh, yeah, you know, wedge busters what you are. So, you know, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> and uh, but I, I went up there with Herb and started training. I enjoyed doing it, and uh, I liked it. And I got that wrestling bug in me, that pro wrestling thing, and uh, it overtook me. I graduated from college and kept doing it. Then I was a teacher and a coach in a high school north of Memphis for two years. And uh, I finally decided I'm going to try this on my own. I'll give it five years. And because uh, teaching and coaching in the 70s, there was no oh, money in that. The, 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 I mean, there it, was no money. What, what, I mean, sport did you, what sport did you coach? Were you coaching football? Or I, you, I, was uh, I, was, I was coaching high school football, junior okay. high. And, for, and for, we, we, it, was a, it was a ninth, nine through 12 uh, a school and a very small school. We only had 20 players. 
And wow, <laughs> so, wow, so we, wow, we, yeah, no, no one know. came out the field basically there with, with 11. Uh, wow, yeah, and uh, so I coached the B team, we coached the freshman team, we coached varsity, so we we had you know three games a week, and uh, and sometimes we would just change uniforms on the guys as freshmen to stick them in in varsity, which you know, totally illegal, but it is what it is. And, but I did that. And I said, you know, I'm making $700 a month teaching school and coaching. I've got to, I've got to be able to do better than this because I actually believed, uh, Dan and Don, I believed Sputnik Monroe when I watched the wrestling on TV, that it was diamond rings, limousines, you know, a rich girl's lover and a poor girl's dream. Uh, I thought, I thought, man, this is, you know, I, I can get into Cadillacs and diamond rings and boy, did I learn very early in my career that after I quit my job teaching, <laughs> there was no diamond rings and limousines. I mean, there was $5 payoff. And I, I wrestled Luthes for nine bucks. I made $9. Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> you live to tell about it, though, right? <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah, and I live to tell about it. So, but uh, that's that's how it happened for me. And uh, Coco and I had we trained together for almost a year, and we had matches together. And what they call nowadays, there's a polite term for it. They call it independent wrestling. We were called outlaws. Oh, we the outlaw wow. group. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, we, but, but that, there was the that was the territory territorial uh, era, correct? Was there just a yeah, territories yeah. that were taking yeah. place? Yeah, so if you didn't if you didn't work for one of the territories, uh, then if you were doing spot shows for some little independent promotion, uh, you were called an outlaw. And the uh, mainstream promoters they didn't like you doing outlaws because they wanted to protect their territory. Ah. <laughs> so. right, well, 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 what are your thoughts about the territory? Uh, did, did, were you like, did you think that they were a good concept, bad concept? I mean, so again, just for, for some of our, our viewers there, to our, if they don't know the concept of a territory, you would be working in, in a, a region, whether it be at the West Coast, East Coast, North, South. And there were so many different territories, and the various promoters were very protective. But correct me if I'm wrong on anything I'm saying there, as well, they're hard to Because it's a, uh, and you would be there for a certain a uh, length of time doing your run, and then when things are coming to an end, it, there would usually be something that would be worked into that the professional match where a loser leaves town type of an angle, and then you would lose, and then that's when you head on off to the next territory. Am, am I kind of correct how I summarize yeah, that? Yeah, that's, that's exactly how we did it, and uh, uh, it, to me, it was a great concept because younger guys had a place to go, there was territories all over the world. You always had a place to work. You, you know, you weren't going to get wealthy unless you were a top guy, but that took time to be a top guy. And so you, you prodded along and you, you, you learned your craft, you perfected your craft, which is important. You know, it's like any job. You got to, you got to start at the bottom, work your way to the top. But the only way to do that is experience. You can't learn to drive the truck by watching videos. You got to get in the seat of the truck and drive it. Yes. And, uh, and but uh, when they took the as the territory started to fade away, then, of course, jobs went away and guys weren't able to work as much. And uh, the, the thing about the territory was it was networking because, uh, say, I, I met uh, uh, Don Fry in Texas and and then Don moved on to Minnesota uh, and he would call me and we were friends. He'd say, listen, there's a spot up here. Uh, I think you'd, you'd fit in good. So, you know, if you weren't happy where you were, you'd leave and go there and you networked and maybe in Minnesota, I might've met uh, uh, Dan to be Severn. And he said, look, this thing in Michigan's really good over there. I'm going there, could be a spot for you. So then you'd go there and the networking was what was important. And uh, uh, you know, if you were good at it and good, you had to be somewhat of a politician too. You didn't want to step on other guys' toes and cause trouble. And uh, you know, I was trained to go in the locker room, sit down and shut up. If there was a chair in there and it was empty, ask whose it was. Don't go sit down in it because it could belong to someone. It was their yes. chair. And and even he, he was gone from the territory. Uh, it was still his chair until someone said, OK, you can go sit in it. And uh, so wow, yeah, <laughs> it, it, was, it was. Yeah, I mean, you just didn't walk in and take over the locker room. Somebody beat the shit out of you. 
No, I actually, well, even when I, when, when I first started working for the WWF, I, again, I was kind of like that same way. When I walk in there, I'm, I'm just, my mouth is, 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 uh, is shut. And I'm just looking around to watch out, watching for the dynamics, what's happening right now. Because yeah. it's kind of like going, I'll take this little quiet corner over here, stay out of people's way. Because I don't, again, I don't know all the dynamics of who's who, the whole nine yards. I go, we just stay back and we'll watch what's happening before me. I, I just, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the territories when, by the time I went to WWE, I knew everyone in the locker room because I had met them over the years, whether it be uh, in Pensacola or Puerto Rico or Japan or Canada, wherever it might be. I, I knew every person in that locker room, uh, whether it be Hulk Hogan, John Studd, uh, Paul Orndorff, Roddy Piper. We were all, we really were a fraternity of guys and, and a family. And, and somehow or another, uh, the, that fraternity and family of guys was ripped apart. I don't know if, uh, who was behind doing it. Was it the money? Was it the greed? Was it, uh, all those things that go into it, but it eventually got to the place where you, when you came in, uh, Dan, you saw it, you saw how it was. Oh, it was no, not I, a I did. I mean, that's good. That's why I just I, I stayed back and watched the dynamics. And that's even I still remember when first first couple of days I was at the WWF. I, I'm just sitting there in the whatever whatever location we're in that arena, and they've got a cafeteria set on them. And I'm just sitting there with my with my planner and my cell phone, and I'm just doing my thing. And uh, Jim Cornette comes back up behind me. And he, 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 he he's like rub up uh, uh, my shoulders. He goes. What are you doing there, Dan? I said, well, I said, Jim, I said, I'm just sitting back here watching theater unfold before me right now. He says, he says, he goes, he goes, all the boys are nervous around you. He said, because you're not talking. I go, <laughs> I'm not talking because I'm being observant because I'm watching all the dynamics unfold. I go, I go, I don't have to say nothing, you know. He goes, he says, stay quiet. He could, it's good to have them a little on the little on the nervous side here. So I don't but, know. What? It wasn't like that before, though, in, in the beginning and my, you know, up to about, I, I didn't go to WWE. I was 15 years in the business. So everyone in the locker room there, when I got there, had been around 15, 20 years. So uh, it was a whole so different ball 15 game. Years, 15 years, like on, on the independent scene before going yeah, to the I had been out of, Yeah, I had been all over the world in 15 years before I went there. So I had, wow. like, you know, it's what I talked about perfecting your craft. I had learned what to do and how to do it. And, and, uh, you know, it was like riding a bicycle once you've learned everything. So were you always the were you always a honky tonk man or no, I picked that up uh Don down in uh Pensacola, Florida. Uh I needed a change from blonde hair and all these things. It just uh, the career wasn't going anywhere. It was it was stale. And I was working against this boy, Austin Idol. Uh, and, uh, he had blonde hair, I had blonde hair and I wanted to get out of the blonde hair business and, and try to do something else. And, and I had the sideburns. I had these damn things since college in the seventies. Uh, you know, they're very popular in 72, 73, and I just kept them the whole time. <laughs> so <laughs> even with blonde hair, I had the uh, sideburns. So, uh, then, uh, we did a thing called a hair dye match where it wasn't room for two blondes in the territory, somebody, instead of, you know, it was always a haircut match. You're going to lose your hair. We're going to shave yes, your yes. head. Yes. It's, that's all, you know, so we, we. Uh, I, I literally never heard of that. I never heard of a, actually someone, a loser having had color of hair. First time I've ever heard that. So, one. so, so oh, yeah, great. we, and it's, I don't think it's ever been done since, but we did it. And, uh, uh, Idol and I put it together and Ron Fuller and Robert Fuller, the promoters, they liked the idea because they were always open to ideas from, from, from the wrestlers, from you. And, and that's important too. If, when you come up with something you think you can do and you're confident you can do it, you pitched it to them and, and to other promoters and they would let you give it a try. And if it worked, you know, you ran with it. If it didn't, then, uh, you know, you go back to doing something else or you do things what they tell you to do. But we did that. And I was able to, to use this spray color where you back then they had spray you could spray in your hair so i would i would go we would we did it on tv where he would do the spray anyway i went to each town 
and every night I lost, he would get the spray can and spray my hair. So then we went back on TV after six nights of doing this all over the territory and doing good business with it. Then I showed up on the TV with the black hair and I left a little white spot right in front like Sputnik Monroe. And, uh, <laughs> And, and that was all that was left of my pretty blonde hair is this right here. And then we went for another three or four or five weeks, me chasing him, saying that I was going to, you know, I was going to pluck him like a chicken and pull all his hair out. And it was a good little concept. But when the black hair came along, some wrestling fans said, have you ever tried the Elvis thing? No, I don't like Elvis. I like the Beatles and Rolling Stones. And so, <laughs> so they brought me a jumpsuit they measured me and got it for me for a christmas present a gold lame jumpsuit was, was this the promotion that did this or was no, this fans? The, it was it was some fans really some wow. wrestling fans and i've always told people i even told stone cold steve austin once he said you know i don't want to be a good guy and the fans are cheering for me i said, I said steve do what the fans want if they i said don't change what you're doing just keep being a bad guy, but if they're cheering for you, just go with it. And then, of course, he became one of the uh, phenomenal good guys in the business, but never changed him being stone cold. So I, I got the dead gum jumpsuit, and Ron, uh, Robert Fuller, Ron's brother, he said, uh, he said, man, you know, can you play a guitar? I said, no, I don't know anything about it. He said, I'm going to bring you one. And he said, uh, you don't know anything about it. I said, no. He said, oh, that'll even be better because the worse you are, the better to be. <laughs> and then the next week he had a guitar and I hit uh, Bob Armstrong with the guitar across the back and we were off and running, selling out everywhere with that dead gum thing. And those rednecks down in Alabama and, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Florida up there in the, in the Gulf Coast said, have somebody going out there acting like they were Elvis Presley. It, it, I, I had death threats. I had tires slashed, windshields broken on my car. You name it. I fought my way out of buildings every night. It was like, what have I got myself into? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I had learned to fight my way out of the buildings in Puerto Rico. I spent a year down there with the blonde hair and, you know, fighting for your life every night there. And, uh, I mean, you know, we didn't, <laughs> I don't know how you guys did it. I, I don't like punching people. It hurts my hands, but to have to do it on a nightly basis was horrible. And, you know, you see knives, you see guns and it was, it was not easy, but I knew that if I keep doing this, it's going to catch on and I'll make some money. We well, do okay, everything. Yeah, just, just, just for the fans' <laughs> sake, though, you you started off for, for, for the fans' sake. You started off originally wanting to be a baby face, but you said that that character wasn't getting over. So then you had this this idea of well, of the that, that, you know, D WWE wanted. To, that's how uh, Vince wanted. He wanted to be a, a good guy, but I had okay, developed. So again, we're, again, I developed we're still we're still we're still speaking before you ever went to yeah. WWF, right? This is I, yeah, I, I had totally developed it as a bad guy. I mean, because everyone hated this character. I mean, they hated it. And and the thing was, WWE didn't know it. They don't. Uh, they don't really watch talent very much. Vince never watches wrestling on TV. He he. I mean, for for, for him for somebody to say, yeah, we got this uh, UFC fighter coming, and his name's Don the Predator Fryer, Dan the Beast Severn. He'd go, oh, okay, uh, okay. Well, if you think they'll do good, bring them in. He, he didn't know who you were. He didn't know who I was when I came in there at all. He never seen any of my stuff. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, he don't, he didn't ever watch anything. He just, uh, he didn't know when he wanted this. And I said, uh, Vince is not going to work. I've developed this character to be a bad guy. And he didn't know I had been working in Canada for three years as this bad guy on national television across Canada. It was I was in BC in British Columbia and the TV there went across the nation like Turner Broadcasting did. Okay. You guys will remember the 605 TV show World Championship Wrestling from Atlanta and on the cable station. This went all over Canada every five o'clock every Saturday across Canada. So all the Canadian people knew me. My first shows for WWE on TV 
were in Toronto at the Toronto TV tapings. So every person in Canada booed me when I walked out. And that went on for three TV tapings that night. <laughs> <laughs> I, had three, I had three weeks of going out there trying to be a good guy and everybody in the building, 20,000 people, booing the crap out of me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, they, they, so when did you finally decide, well, forget good guy, let's just, let's I, roll with the, what the fans he, want. You know, God bless some of the, the the bad guys that I was working with, the Don Morocco and and Iron Mike Sharp and and some of those guys. They went back and they were complaining. They were saying every time we hit this guy, they cheer us. You know, Bob Orton uh, Jr. He they're out there kicking me and beating on me, and the people are cheering, "Yeah, kill him, beat him, kill him." And they're going, "Man, this guy's killing us. We can't work with him." So they had to sw- they had to switch. They once they switched me, boom, it was. I was off. I, I, I knew then I've, I'd struck gold. It was a gold mine. Well, I said, if I get it, I'll... But, but that's the part that I remember. I say, I, I never knew you as a, <laughs> as a baby face. I always saw you going out there oh, doing all your stuff. No. And the people just wanted to get a piece of you because you it did was, such a good job of being that. It, it was horrible. It was horrible to try to be a good guy. You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, Dan, you could be a good guy, but Don, I, I mean, it's hard for Don to go out there and be a, be a good guy. They, they, you know, they want to see him go to work out there, man. And uh, for him to go out there and lay around and beg and plead and, oh, you know, and they, they boo you out of the building. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Like, they like throwing stuff at me. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, and I, you know, I did see something on you, Don, and I don't know. I'm sure you've had to talk about it a lot. But when you and that Japanese boy went toe-to-toe for about five minutes, that was a – that's the darnest thing I ever seen in my life. Yeah, that was him, him versus Takayama and Pride, and it was like a spectacle that uh, uh, nobody wants to be really a part of. I mean, because you know, you know, they literally they were playing a game of chicken. They they were they literally had a collar tie on each other, and they're punching each other simultaneously. This guy like going, "Hey, you son of a bitch! I'm gonna keep punching the face. I ain't gonna quit." And the other guy's like, "No, you son of a bitch! I'm keep punching you in the face until you quit." Uh, well, you know, I, I ran across those old timers like that when I was starting out, uh, you know, like this. I, I asked my trainer, Herb Welch, who had wrestled Lou a lot of times. I said, uh, he, they got me booked with Lou Thez next Saturday night. I said, what, what can I look for? And he said, well, he's going to test you now. I said, okay. And so he got, uh, uh, Herb got up in the ring with me. He was about 70 years old at the time. He crawled up there and he said, now, look, here's what he's going to do. This is the first thing he's going to do. And then he's going to do this. Then he's going to do this. And he showed me how to, how to counter Counter. everything Uh that, that he he didn't teach me to shoot on Lou. I wasn't going to leg dive Lou says I wasn't going to get kicked in the head because that's what he would do. He'd kick me in the face if I tried it. (laughs) So I let Lou, I went there and I let him and he did everything that Herb had showed me he was going to do. And I was able to go with it and counter it, pull it back. Because first thing he does, he's going he's gonna to double wrist lock and take you over. That's the very first thing he's going to do. He told me, he said, he's going to double wrist lock. He's going to take you over now. And he's going to cinch it up. And he's going to get you in the head scissors. He said, then, then when he finds out you can work, he'll, he'll back off. But first thing Lou asked me, it's like we always do, who trained you? And I said, Herb Welch, he said, he's a good trainer. He's a good man. He said, we'll have some fun out there. Now, he did. He beat me up, but, it, I mean, that was normal. Really? Lou always beat people. In a nice way, he beat you up. Yeah, there you go. Well, yeah, nice I mean, they, he, I, yeah, I mean, you know, he bloodied my nose and my ears and, and everything, but it wasn't too bad. It, I was sore for a couple of days. <laughs> but everything he did, I was able to counter it and go with it. And he told the promoter at the end of it, I want to, uh, next time I come back next month, I want to work with this kid again. So I ended wow, up having about that, a, I, that was actually a yeah. very big compliment. So I ended up with a half dozen matches with this. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, we were friends the whole time till he passed away. Greatest guy in the world. Easy. Once he liked you, he was good to you in the ring. Yeah. I, I first met Luthez when I was going over to Japan, uh, working for the, UWFI group uh, at that point. Yeah, I and, remember uh, that those was, guys. Uh, yeah, that was actually, you know, because it was just a strong style as all it was, which is a strong style of uh, wrestling. 
They, you just didn't sell nothing unless you felt it, and they, they were throwing yeah. some pretty good leg kicks and things of that nature. But uh, and also Billy Robinson. That was the first time Billy, beating Billy Robinson. Well, I was going. I, I'm glad you brought. I'm glad you brought Billy up. Okay, I had him too. Now, I uh, I seem to get all these guys for some unknown reason. I had Al Costello. He was an old. Al was an old time shooter and hooker. You know, from Australia. Uh, he had a big run up in the Detroit area. The the uh, the kangaroos the fabulous kangaroos yes uh, many many years ago and he was at the end of his career and you know having to go out and do 20 minute time limit with a young kid like me so i mean he took me to task for 20 minutes and you know it, it is what it is but billy robson same with billy billy was really difficult and billy was a big guy a lot of people don't understand he was a big englishman you know not too you many englishmen as big as billy and uh, but he was a he was a struggle. He was a little rough. He didn't hurt me, but he let me know he was there. Yeah. Well, like I said, I, by the time I met uh, both Lou and uh, Billy, I mean they were. Yeah, I mean they, they were well up in, in their years at that point. But you know they they being the, the Japanese organization liked their history, their heritage, and we're playing off of that. I mean, that's, that's one thing that, that I really liked about the, the Japanese culture. They're really big about uh, uh, the, I, almost like the longer that you stick around in the industry, the more they hold you in that hierarchy like, like that. So, yeah, and they just, I, with, with, with Billy, I had worked a lot when I first started out, especially in Pensacola and Memphis and, and, and uh, with the Tony Charles. Now, Tony was an Englishman, a small English guy, and he was a he was the guy that worked in the, out of the Florida office uh, before I got started. And he was the, with uh, Matt Suda. Matt Suda would train the guys, but Tony Charles was the Tony was the hooker and the shooter who who kind of roughed kids up pretty bad. And he was known for that. But then uh, great worker, easy. But I learned the, the British style from him. So when I got to Billy Robinson, I understood it and I name dropped, of course, working with Tony and that made it a little bit easier with Billy. And mind you, when I got to, when I had Billy, I had already been in Japan. I had done the come out of Puerto Rico where I was fighting for my life every night. So I wasn't scared of fighting. And not after that, I wasn't scared of getting hit in the head with bricks and rocks and things like that either. So I learned how to dodge real fast. And the rope of dope you know with your heads uh, but i was over there six weeks on that uh, thing with baba a championship carnival and then working with all the japanese boys and all the american boys uh, and so i had learned the japanese style in that six weeks over there so the things billy did was didn't surprise me he was just he didn't want to cooperate there again he was toward the end of his career and these old guys get sour and bitter and they don't want to be cooperative in the ring. It's like pulling teeth. Well, I mean, Billy seemed like he was in a lot of pain though, too. Uh, I, I well, don't yeah, that, but... <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that was after uh, uh, Sailor White had uh, beat the shit out of him, pissed on him too. So you know, oh. <laughs> I, get... <laughs> I, I just know that Billy enjoyed a lot of, uh, uh, Adult beverages, they're just the kind of, I think, I, and I kept thinking, oh, maybe it was just to, to soothe the pain. I, I, I'm not sure. Well, that. that was normal. Uh, that was normal British style, you know, to, to, to get up in the morning and start drinking pints of beer. But, uh, and then, of course, you mix that in with the uh, goofy, noofy uh, Sailor White, who was a lovely, uh, just a great guy, one of my roommates one time. And, uh, but to hear that story was like, okay, there's two guys that were, you know, goofy, noofy, and a drunken Englishman, things are going to happen. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and they were friends. Wow. They were in the well, bar well, drinking. Next thing you know, they're punching each other, pissing on each other. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I can see the punching each other. I think that's taking a little bit too far in the second part here right now. But, that, uh, that made me wow. think of, make me think of maybe Don and I on a road trip for about three, 400 miles. You know, who knows what would happen? <laughs> <laughs> wow so dan, dan you who trained who trained you in the pro ranks it was uh well it was kind of ironic because you mentioned the fabulous kangaroos did you ever uh meet a gentleman by the name of denny cass or dennis casper i mean that, his real name was dennis casper 
but he was also known as Denny Cass. He was one half of the Fabulous Kangaroos as well. But I don't, he wasn't the original Kangaroos. I no, think the original was, a, was Roy, Roy and uh, Hefferman and, uh, and uh, Al Costello. Okay. So I, I know I didn't know him. Uh, yeah, well, again, it was a, a gentleman that, uh, again, his, like I said, his real name was uh, uh, Dennis Kasperowitz, but he, he wrestled as Professor Sir Moniker Denny Cass, um, he was a fabulous kangaroos. He did a few other types of things, but he was also the president of the Michigan Wrestling Club, uh, you know, and you know, a, a legitimate amateur wrestling organization. And I was the coach of it at that at that time. So we're talking somewhere in, in the mid '80s. Okay. And then uh, when when all of our long about uh, 1984, that's when a new rule came down from the United States Olympic Committee that allowed athletes to, to be both amateur and professional simultaneously. As long as you were no longer competing for uh, the United States or you know, for trying to make an Olympic team and national team, you, you're good to go. So uh, at that point, I could have my cake and eat it too. So long about that, uh, excuse me, it was 1992. I started talking with, with uh, Denny Cass about this. And he tried to discourage me at first. He goes, but if you still <laughs> want to pursue it, he goes, I'll take you to this place. You know, that, that kind of story. I'll take you to this place. And that's really what, what, what it was. I mean, he, he, he did a good job trying to discourage me. And and, and I don't know. You, you laughed when, when, when he said that, when I said that. So w why? First off, why? Because I think I know why, but, you know, I just wouldn't want to say it. Well, it's just not easy. Everyone thinks it's so easy. That, that you see it and you watch it and you think, man, I can do this. This is easy. Well, and they just show up and they think they can just do it. And, and you can't. It's, it takes a long time to learn this pro wrestling. A lot, it, you know, uh, and, and both of you guys have done it and you both say, yeah, you know, after about five years, I went, oh, I've been doing this all wrong. Because it really takes about five years to even understand it. Yeah. Because you're th there's so much stuff thrown at you that's yeah. it's not even logical. Some yeah. of it's not even logical. Yeah. Like, you, 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 you know, you and, and, and uh, am amateur Sorry, wrestlers, a, a lot of amateur wrestlers have never, ever done very well in the pro ranks. I mean, percentage-wise, there's very far and few in between who have picked it up and was able to do it and do it you know, fairly yeah. good. Ego, ego gets in the way. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the worst thing is to go out there with a young amateur. And I had one, one time, and he turned out to be a pretty good wrestler, uh, 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 a boy named Buzz Sawyer. And he was oh. just starting out in, 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 uh, in Florida. I was in Tampa and, uh, you know, I'd been around three, four years and, and I kind of knew what was going on. And here I'm booked with this boy and just out of the, just out of the blue, he was, he understood a little bit about the pro stuff, but just out of the blue, he'd grab you and take you down just for no reason. And then tie you up. Well, if you take me down and tie me up, this match is dead. Now it's over. You take me down, but don't just tie me up and leave me there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but he ended up being a pretty good pro wrestler. One of the top guys in Atlanta for a long time. Oh, sorry, a tough son of a bitch he was. Yeah, no, I, I and, heard a lot, and, of good, a lot, a lot of good but, things about, but, about him. But, but to discourage you, I would tell him, I didn't, I've never even asked my son or tried to train him or not anything. I, it's, it's so, it's a very complicated business and yeah. you know it, Dan. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough industry because you're on the road for so many days in a row. And then that's where I get, you know, I, I, people have asked me before, you know, did, uh, you know, how did you succeed? I go, it, you know, to be successful and, and you probably uh, agree to this. It's kind of a very lonely road because you're on the road and you travel from, from town to town to town. It's, uh, I, it's not, I, out of my five children, I did not want, I had three sons and I did not want any of them to follow and dad's footsteps either. I, I would like to, you know, them to wrestle, amateur, stuff like that, but to go into cage fighting or to professional wrestling, that's such a tough industry that, no, I did not want them to do that. Yeah, the, uh, uh, to, I, I've told a lot of kids, listen, you got a good job. Keep your job. Do this yeah. as a hobby. 
just treat this as a hobby, do it as a part time and have fun with it. But, you know, to quit your job and it's going to destroy your family because you're going to be away. You're going to do things out on the road that you shouldn't be doing. And the, I mean, the things are just going to happen. Shit is going to happen. Uh, yep. And the next thing you know, you're in trouble. Then you're in jail, and uh, it's, it's it's not a good life at all. <laughs> no, no, no. It, well, again, what you said, it takes time to learn your craft, but then you're, you're all by yourself. There, there's there are a lot of things against the industry, and it still it still continues to this to this day. And I it's always not a that. team. It's not a team. You're not on a wrestling team. Yes, correct. You're, the locker the locker room has no team concept to it. And if you're a team person, it's not going to work for you. No. It's just not going to work. That is, so, again, because as you're as you're getting over and becoming more successful, it's taken away from others that might be on well, that roster. There, so yeah, the, he, he goes through getting away there as, as well. That's when the swords come out. You know, the knife in the back, a smiles, a frown turned upside down. <laughs> so, I like that. <laughs> nice, nice. So, so yeah. Now, Don. Yes, sir. You had to at least learn some pro wrestling. Yes, sir. But it didn't, didn't stick with me very well. That's for sure. Well, you, who trains you? Brad Reagan's trained me, Brad. Oh, you, hey, Brad's a good guy. He is. He yeah. was a good. Yeah. He, Hennig, Kurt Hennig would drop in, you know, a couple of oh. times. <laughs> what, what would he come in? Just yeah. to razz on you a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. He'd come in and stir shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, each bomb you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Brad. Uh, Brad was a, just a sweetheart of a guy. Brad's too nice to be in pro wrestling. Yeah, he is. He's he was too nice and uh, serious, yeah. too nice. too polite. And uh, yeah, he came along when he came over to the WWE. It was late in his career. His his body was shot. His knees were gone, and he he couldn't. He just hated to travel. He hated it. He didn't like it. Yeah, he was a good man. Real good. Man. He was. Uh, he trained some good boys up there. He trained a lot of guys. He worked out with a lot of guys. Yeah. I don't know how the heck he trained Leon white, but he did uh, somehow. <laughs> did, were you, were you in that class or uh, was no, Leon sir. before? No, sir. He was Leon was before me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it was just, uh, it was just, um, uh, Brian Johnson and I, and they, they had a few others come in, but then they would, you know, they'd quickly leave, you know, but they were just getting Brian Johnson and I, uh polishing the turd enough to present it over there in japan you know yeah uh why did you pick uh, uh awa or minnesota to get trained oh they picked me sir they picked me oh uh, yeah. brad did brad recruited you sir um i guess they had new japan pro wrestling was looking for somebody from uh who's a real shooter you know to uh to build up over there, American bad guy. And uh, so they had Ken Shamrock, and then Ken took his contract, went to WWE, you know, and jumped ship. Oh, okay. Signed it. And so okay. They left him high and dry. So Rad called up uh, Jeff Blatnick, you know, because they were together on the Olympic team and asked Jeff um, who he would recommend. God bless him. He recommended me. And so Brad called me up and I met Brad and Masa Saito and Antonio Inoki, you know, a couple other guys up there and we just all hit it off really well. Yeah. That's the, that's a heck of a story there with that. And, yeah, see, and Dan, Jeff, you... Jeff, 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 give you a little bit more history. Jeff Batnick, who he's talking about right now was 1984 uh, Olympic gold medalist and Greco Roman. Yeah, so, yeah. But he, but he also was working for the uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship at one point in time as one of their uh, color commentators. Um, I mean, I, I, I'd known Jeff Latnick for quite a few years as he was doing his actual amateur wrestling career. Uh, he was from Brockport State uh, College uh, wrestler. And again, I, again, I, I know him back in, the, in the, the 70s and stuff like that. And uh, then, and, and literally get up to the point that when the uh, UFC is starting to really build and get some momentum, you know, I think uh, I saw him probably uh, back in New York at some pay per view, UFC pay per view that was taking place. We're both sitting out in the uh, in the stands while 
people are doing this and that, and we're just kind of reminiscing about our, our amateur wrestling days and, and and thinking, did you ever think that this thing would ever get off the ground and be where at? And then the fact that we're just two old amateur wrestlers, and now we're here in, in this new industry, you know. So, and and and, and, and the sad part was a month later he had a heart attack and, and gone. So that's uh, you know, you talked about being in a WWE locker room sitting by yourself, and and, and Don just mentioned Ken Shamrock. I when I was there, and it was a tail end of me finishing up and getting out of there on the second or third time I'd been there. You know, I either quit or got fired three or four times. There's no big deal. And uh <laughs> so, the, the, the cycle of a professional wrestler is like you either leave on your own accord or they fire you. <laughs> yeah, I mean it it didn't matter either way. I mean if they want you there you'll be there. If they don't you'll be gone either either on your own accord or they'll they'll show you where the door is. But uh Dan uh, uh Ken was sitting there in the in the thing uh the lunchroom area you know that yeah, thing yeah yep. whatever they do and thanks thanks to the union workers we were able to get that before that we didn't have any of that it was only only the union guys could go in there and have that so wow. but the union guys would see us and say come on in and eat and we said no we're not allowed and they said oh come on in you guys come on in and have some of this food uh but if we did we'd go in and grab some and run out the door with it and because there was a sign on the door said uh uh uh, uh union uh, no wrestlers allowed union yeah. workers only but the union the one thing the good the good thing the union did was get us uh get us into catering but oh, yeah. <laughs> i tell that story it's funny we would go in and steal the food because you know we'd been there all day and we I mean, weren't allowed I mean, to go they, in and, and let's face it wrestlers eat pretty darn healthy there too so yeah it's yeah cool. yeah so so ken was sitting there and, and I, I i don't know i hate to see a guy sit there alone for and i'd seen ken on the ufc stuff and and I walked over and sat down when we started a conversation. Very pleasant. Ken was on my podcast once and always pleasant, always nice, professional to me. And, and I enjoyed being around him. But the other guys would sit there and wouldn't talk to him. They were like you said, Dan, it was like, OK, here's this guy coming in. What are they doing with him? Yeah, you know, outsider, they, uh, a threat to my job. You yeah, bet, yeah. But, you know, big time shooter. Vince is probably paying him a lot of money. And and Ken actually, when I did the podcast, Ken told me that he was one of the first, I think he might've been the first guy that was given a guaranteed contract from WWE. There was guys that came after that who got guaranteed contracts. See, okay. I was, my contract was 10 days, $150 a day. That was wow. a $1,500. So after 10 days, my contract was done. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that was, I, I mean, I, I, I could tell you about my contract. That'd be basically, what? I had, uh, you know, they wanted me to be full time, but I did not want to be full time because I was Vince did not know how old I was in the first place. And I kept thinking because I was, I was a lot, lot older. I, I think I was uh, 48 when I when I finally did sign on with them. But it was uh, I was already working for the NWA and they wanted me to be full, be full time exclusive to them. I go, no. I, I Again, because I don't think they understood how old I was in the game. It's kind of going, I'll I'll wrestle for you guys, but knowing that if I have a free weekend, I would I'd work for NWA one weekend. I'd be working for the WWF another weekend. I'd be do, jumping in the middle and doing a mixed martial arts match here or there. And then whoever else wanted to book me, but I always told people that when it came to professional wrestling, I'm not going to go out there and discredit this belt, this NWA belt that I'm running around there with. I mean, I, I always I always use this scenario. I'm not going to go out there and let Doink the Clown beat me. And yet uh, I, I use it as a scenario. And I remember one night working and I am having my ass handed to me by Doink the Clown, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were probably in there with the, the, the original Doink in that, that. He was a good wrestler. If it was Matt Bourne. Yes, yeah, yeah, that, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Matt, Matt would, Matt would, Matt would, take you to task on the he would get down on the mat with you you yeah. know if you wanted if you want to get on all fours he'd, he'd oblige you real fast <laughs> and uh, so but uh yeah uh it, it was uh, now don would have been perfect for that uh, uh and i was gone by then for that uh tough tough uh whatever what did they call yeah, that, that mess that, dan uh, yeah exactly that bra for all the bra for bra all for all that yes uh, but, you know, but, I mean, that, I was, knew. that was a bad, bad concept in general. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, it, it, it was off to bring bring in the uh, um, Steve Williams, right? Yeah, Steve Williams, Dr. Death, Steve Williams. That that was the whole thing that was that, that was supposed to be for. But then, 
you know, the fact his leg, that it, his it leg, was, you know, it, his leg blue. Yeah. Right in the yeah. And then, you, and then they got to bring Butterbean in to clean that mess up, you know, and it was come on. It was, that's one of those things where, remember I, I said earlier, where sometimes the amateur wrestlers never made the, couldn't make the transition, transition into, the pro, yes. into the pro business. Well, wrestlers aren't boxers. Now you're going to put these gloves on these guys. It's a whole different game. It's, it's not the same anymore. Exactly. And you're going to expose, you're going to expose get the guys for being terrible. And most of the wrestlers, you put the gloves on them, they are terrible. And it looked awful. And it was bad. They yeah. would have been better off with the gloves you guys wore. Yeah. They, I mean, to put these big mittens on these guys, come on. That was horrible. And well, it takes away, I feel, so, much, takes away yeah. so much of, of you know, your arsenal. You know, by, you're by, totally exposed now. Yeah. You, I mean, you're out there with these mittens on, and you know you can't hip toss anybody. You can't you can't double wrist lock them. What are you gonna do? Yeah. So yeah. you have to stand yeah. there and punch, and it you looks awful. Be, yeah, yeah. Like I say you can't be a character whatsoever to get yourself over with the crowd, and it's it's like you're being you're being exposed so it, poorly. It, it, that, it, that it, was it, the worst it, thing that, that that first concept ever for professional. It, it's it's a death wish to stand there and be exposed. It's like being stripped naked in front of millions of people, and you're just. You, you got nowhere to go. Nowhere and, to hide. Yeah. They really thought that Steve Williams and it's Steve was in a in a tail end of his career. He was beat up. He couldn't do that. You know, that those years in Japan had destroyed him. And, and the, the six weeks I did over there with Bob on that tour, we had three days off in six weeks. Mm -hmm. It was it was hard. I mean, wow. I had that's a you lot know, of the, matches. The, and the Japanese boys, you know how they are. They speak English to you when they're in the States and they're your friend. They ride in the car with you. You share the beers together. And they get over in Japan. Now they don't speak English anymore. <laughs> whether it be Haku, yeah. whether it be uh, 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 Jumbo, or whether it be Tiger Chung Lee. They, I was like, I just saw you guys two weeks ago over in, 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 in Florida or in Memphis or somewhere. Now you don't want to talk to me. You want to beat me up. And it was a struggle out there. ever Because on that championship carnival, you wrestled everyone you had a different person every night i i was in the ring with uh uh goto when he was just a young kid and 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 momoto was beating on him with a they would take shower shoe and hit this boy in the side of the head every night everybody lined up and hit this kid in the head with a shower shoe and his ear was swollen and just ready to explode and, and uh, wow. i was looking yeah i was looking through the door one night and and uh jack briscoe told me he says close that door don't even look in there i said man they're beating the shit out of this guy he says yeah that's what they do <laughs> wow bad. so yeah, yeah i'd wrestle i'd wrestle one of these young kids one night over there and he'd suplex me 50 times then i'd get in the ring with jack briscoe and have a match you know and then the next <laughs> night i'd be with i'd have bruiser brody and of course you know brody he's got to stay over so he's going to beat you up i mean he he beat me up but he didn't hurt me and uh then the, you'd have baba I, I had him two or three times and, that was the easiest pie. I mean, you didn't want to touch him. You let, just let him chop you and give you that big kick that didn't touch you. <laughs> Jumbo was pretty rough on me. Jumbo, Haku. Yeah. Because they wanted to stay over. I don't know how you guys did it. I don't know how you went over there all that time and did it. I, I never went back. I never had a desire to go back. I was a song and dance man. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be, be <laughs> well, okay. well, I don't want to be beat up. I don't want suplex. And I went over there with a broken ankle. My ankle was cracked. Victor Jovica, the, uh, the, uh, one of the owners in Puerto Rico had dropped me on a, on a, on a finam suplex and my, my foot hit the, hit the mat first. He hmm. went up and just dropped me backwards and, and cracked my left ankle. So I was over there hobbling around and getting taped up every night and, and trying to do all that stuff. I mean, for me, that was some of the biggest crowds I was ever in front of was over in, uh, in front of the J Japanese audience. Was that the same thing for you? I mean, but you also were a, in, in, in a couple of different uh, WrestleMania. So again, what, was your Japanese crowds bigger or was the WrestleMania crowd bigger for you? Oh, the WrestleMania crowds are bigger. They only, uh, on that championship carnival, we went to all those small towns. What one night okay. we would be up north. We we did parking lot shows up there for Baba. It's it's amazing, but uh, you know tent shows on the people sat on the ground. There might be 
60 people, 70 people, sometimes 100 clapping. Then you go down to the big shows in Osaka or, or, or uh, somewhere like that or in, in Tokyo, and you'd have 10,000 people, 10, 12,000. Well, then would you say that uh, when you did your uh, you, you, your match there with Jake the Snake Roberts there in like uh, WrestleMania three? I mean, I because I, I just did a little bit of reading earlier that, that that was like a sellout crowd of like ninety plus thousand yeah. people. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that was. That, that, I mean, that had to be some kind of a record, wasn't it? That you know, for yes, yeah, so that was a record for a long time. But the thing is, the big crowd they were so far away and. It was so loud. You, they looked like little ants out there. They were just people so far away. And you could yell and scream to your opponent as much as you wanted to, and nobody could hear you. You know. Wow. I mean, was, that, was that like in some type of a football stadium or, or what? It, uh... it was at the old Silverdome. Oh, Silverdome. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, I was doing uh, somebody brought the other day when I saw you in Ohio. First time I'd seen you in a long time. It was good to see you again, Dan. The beast was in his, in his, in his, well, I, didn't know, I, I, I didn't know if you'd recognize me because I've, I've kind of, well, yeah, I've kind of let the hair go yeah, from being I mean, dark to, to, to white there, but it's kind of going. Well, but that was I, mean, when I, I just know when I tapped you on the shoulder, you turned around like you're going to take me down. So yeah, it was okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, there was people that showed up there that had pieces of the arena. They're selling, they sell parts of the building. They had to chair backs and chair seats. And uh, the, the top of the arena, they got squares. They cut it and, and sold it to people. All of, For all sorts of sports, they have it. Whether it be basketball, football, it, anything they put in that building, people would buy those things. Yeah, and, and they would bring them down and get them autographed. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it was a big deal. Uh, they were all big, but, uh, you know, when you got your check, you looked at it and you went, whoa, boy, did they give me the old Steely Dan? Yeah, I so, say, uh, yeah, for, for having that many people, <laughs> ninety three thousand people, and there's like well, yeah, the payday wasn't what it's supposed to be. Well, you know, it's, I guess it's all relevant. Maybe who's who knows? Uh, but uh, I, I mentioned that uh, that that Puerto Rico stuff, and then going straight in Japan, uh, the funks were over there. I had to wrestle with the funks. I had to wrestle uh, Abdullah. It was like. Come on, and Abdullah fell on me with that elbow of his. It was he put his whole body on you. It's worse than it was as bad as Savage coming off the top rope. And you know, Savage always wanted you to be his uh his landing pad. And uh, oh, wow. that oh boy, that hurt. I'm telling well, you, it hurt. I, I was gonna bring that that up because that was when, when he had Miss Elizabeth, and again, yep. you're taking in this heel role. And I think I think the biggest heat was when you pushed Miss Elizabeth down. Yeah, that was big. That was. Oh, big. I, I tell you, I, I'm, I'm surprised you got out of that building alive that night. That was big, and uh, uh, Randy, I don't know. Randy was Randy. Every story you've heard about him is true. I, I don't want to trample on a man's grave, but everything it was about. Randy and I got along fine after after we were able to put the gears in place and make them work. He started to trust me a little bit. Uh, because he always thought someone was trying to take advantage of him or get over on him or or any of that stuff and and he had a short fuse and uh he was he was difficult at times but uh we had to go up to his hotel room i did and jimmy hart and we had to go over that pushing of leah's for about two hours one day it went on wow. for like yeah, I'd push her. She'd fall on the bed and oh, do it this way and back. It was like, man, I'm not going to hurt this girl. Don't worry, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> but Randy liked me because one night I, I back suplexed him. He headlocked me. We were close to the rope, so I'm on back suplex. And really, he's, I'm not going to drop on his head. And, uh, and I back suplexed him because I wanted to get a cover on him near the ropes which makes, makes it easy because you're right there. And I came back in the locker room. He said, Woo, don't ever take me back in that suplex again. I don't like it. Yeah. He liked to go forward, Randy did. He did not like to take any kind of bumps backwards like that. Yeah. Really? And it's such an easy little bump. You know that. I mean, guy gets you in a headlock. You work the headlock for a minute and a couple of things. Next thing you know, you give him a trip and, it's, it's such an easy thing to do. And 
I've been hurt on it. Uh, one of the English boys uh, dropped me on the back of my head, made my electricity go through my toes. But, uh, <laughs> and he said, oh, you went up. That's not a good thing. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 he said, it was Jeff, it was Jeff Ports uh, that did that. Uh, oh, English kid. When it's uh, Scott McGee many years ago. Uh, back before you started in WWE, he was there, but he did that to me in Alabama and the crowd was like crazy. You know, I had this good heat. You didn't have to do much with me out there. All you had to do was just, just play, just, you know, just follow me along. Everything's going to be good. And, and the crowd was there and it was time for his comeback. And the first thing he did was grab me and give me that suplex right on the back of my neck. My chin just went all the way through and, you know, um, toes were just tingling and headache. I said, why did you do that? He said, oh, you went up so easy. I said, I'm supposed to go up easy, you idiot. <laughs> After that, if he, if anybody else tried to do that to me, I sat down and they had to take me. Yeah. Because if you, if you have to take me, then you're not going to sling me like a dish rag. At least I'm showing resistance oh. and, and I have time knowing that, that I'm sitting down on you, that I can get tucked. Yeah. Oh. I went right up, legs up in the air, bam. My toes hit behind my head. Oh, yeah. Well, Wayne, I've been hurt. Far worse than my professional wrestling <laughs> career than I have in my other two careers of being an amateur wrestler and a cage fighter. But then if I look at number, what, would I get hurt? Uh, second win, amateur wrestling. The safest thing I've done is cage fight, and you're going out there with evil intent in the first place. So it's like, well, I, I, I don't understand that. But just as we said before, you're only as good as what you continue to hone your skills. Yeah. And once you think you've yeah. made it and you stop working out and stuff like that, your, seal, your skills start to diminish. Yeah, you know? I just, uh, you know, on that deal in Japan, I, I, I wouldn't, I sat down on those Japanese boys. I didn't try to resist. I would didn't try to really resist them, but I, I let my weight. They had to take me over and they, and of course they would, and they knew how to do it. And, but they, they were all pretty good about it. They didn't, uh, they didn't sling you around and hurt you. They didn't, they didn't pull a Don Frow on me, you know, and, and hold me by the collar and beat on me until I was senseless. And Don, how did you feel after that anyway? Where, I mean, were you dozy or, or punch oh, drunk man. or anything? <laughs> I got lucky. I got lucky that night. Didn't get hurt. You know, I just, I was a little bit dizzy, you know, for sure. And, uh, but yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> the, way, the way those two guys were punching each other there, Wayne, I would have thought, okay, I probably see about three Takiyamas now. Don't go for the guy in the right. Left. Keep going for the guy dead center here right now. Yeah, you know? <laughs> Hit the guy I, the I just can't imagine what would have happened if you guys had started just, you know, kicking kicking each other yeah <laughs> <laughs> well he kicked, he kicked me once or twice and that was good enough i mean that old boy's getting those big old thighs like like your old campbell you know yeah he was a pretty big kid yeah, yeah. Like 300 pounder you know yeah uh now what about this uh because i wanted to ask you guys because you knew him i didn't run across him he did go through that power plant in uh wcw uh sap Bob Sapp. Bob Sapp. Uh, Bob's a great guy. I love Bob. He's the he nicest guy in the world. Just a, a big kitty cat, man. He really is. He's a, he, just a big old, big old football player that, that, uh, you know, just, he, he, he get like a gentle giant, just like what Don just, the, 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 described right there. You know, just, uh, I don't think he was not cut out for pride at all. Would you say Don? No, no. I mean, like, uh, Maurice. I mean, he, he was a big menacing monster of a human being, but that was not his cup of tea. He he did great in the movies and things of that nature. And and the both uh Don and him were in a couple of different movies together there, Wayne. It was uh they 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 were, they, they did some great characters in, in his movies. I uh -huh. I could see I could see why he was over there because you know the Japanese love monsters. Yeah. They just love that big monstrous person and and like Brody, Brody got over being a looking like a, a Neanderthal man, and, and and coming out there and slinging a chain, and people running and scurrying away. And Abdullah was a big monster, and, and uh, so I could see you at Bob, but I mean he was, he just come at you, you know, throw he threw haymakers, I guess. He, he's a big fella. Oh my God, you see him uh, 
drop no gear on his head. Oh my God, this is brutal. Just brutal. But then, you know, when he, when he did get beat up, he went down pretty fast. So, uh, <laughs> um, like Marie Smith, you said, you know, he, he's, he was training Bob. He says, you know, for somebody who can't fight, he sure makes a hell of a lot of money, you know? And <laughs> yeah, he, he, he was in the, he, he was in the right place to, uh, with his size and his look. Cause he did, he looked like a big monster and, uh, yeah, I always wondered about him and, uh, Brad you know, Ray, I'm, I, it's all about timing, you know? Yeah. I ran across a kid in Vancouver many, many years ago. I don't know if you guys ran across him in Japan because he went, he, he went, he was in Vancouver. He was a uh, super heavyweight champion over there, John Tenta. He was a Canadian champion. He went to LSU and then he got into Sumu and then he went for Baba and, uh, was in W finally came into WWE, big John Tenta. Yeah, I, was I he knew there? him this, I knew him during his amateur rest of the days, John Tenta, yes. Yeah, yeah. Good, real good amateur, big kid, and, yes. and a, a pretty good sumo guy. And uh they put him, you know, he had worked with Hogan and and worked all over and worked around the world with the uh, uh, Baba and Enoki's groups. Then he worked with Hogan, and then they put him in wrestling school in WWE for some unknown reasons. Like, why? The last thing he did was that oddities with the insane clowns. Insane yeah, clowns. Insane, yeah, insane clown posse. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever work Big for that John. organization? Did you ever work for that organization? Insane oh, clown yeah, posse? I, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, I, I met those kids in Detroit. Uh, what was that guy? Doyle? Mickey Doyle. They were oh, friends yeah, with this, yeah, Mickey Doyle, this boy, Mickey Doyle, out of out of Detroit. I met them in Detroit on a Mickey Doyle show. He booked me up there, and I, I saw these kids. They were just teenagers, and uh, they uh, they liked me. I liked them. I I liked watching what they did because they were so, you know, off the wall. Then I ended up doing some of the stuff for them guys, and no, not my cup of tea. Oh, did you I do one like, of theirs? I mean, you got yeah i, I actually did did, did, uh, did a couple of their shows but, but the show i think started at one o'clock in the morning that's when the show started yeah yeah out in the, the, last... middle, of the, out in the middle of a field or nowhere and uh you know. yeah nah, not my not my deal any uh, no nah, I, I i just turned i look back on it and i think man how did this all happen for me young clean cut college boy that's how I met Bill Eady, you know, demolition. I was, <laughs> I walked in the lock, I walked in the locker room in Atlanta and I sat down beside Bill Eady and we started talking and, and, uh, he and I were the only two guys in the locker room had a college education out of like 30 people. So that's how we hit it off. We became friends after that and friends to this day, but here I'm a clean cut kid and holy cow, man. Oh man. I was at the grocery store the other day. Lady says, it's your birthday. How do you feel? I said, not a day over 70. I just turned 70. Oh, wow. Well, well, you said just as recently? Well, happy yeah, birthday. I'm, I'm, I'm 70 years old, man. <laughs> but I'm still a song and dance guy. I'm not going to get out there and pull on anybody. Heck, I yeah. wrestled Stu Hart. Yeah. I wrestled Stu. I wrestled uh, uh, Killer Kowalski. I had all their matches. I had the last match Kowalski. Kowalski ever had. I had the last match that Stu Hart ever had. I had the last match a Crusher ever had. Boy, was that something! You talk about uh, uh, Don, you and you and the Japanese boy punching each other. Yeah. This Crusher man, he he would hit me in the side of the head so hard, it was like, man, oh man, just take it easy, brother. You're just filling in for somebody. You're only here <laughs> for one night. <laughs> holy cow you know i gotta work i gotta work 80 straight nights in a row and you're just here one night <laughs> you know? wow. Wow. i had i had all these old guys man i, I just got I, somehow i got stuck with them and and uh, i got i had bruno and bruno was uh man this easiest pie just be a sweetheart in the ring you just, that, you that, don't... Okay, that always had to be. Uh, be I, I always heard, was told that any time that Bruno was a card, it was a sellout show. He just had s something with the fans right there that, that uh, they always came on out for a Bruno San Martino match. Yep. So I sold out with him on two weeks' notice in Boston, Madison Square Garden, Philadelphia, Chicago, Miami, and where was the other town? I think maybe Detroit. 
about for about a week in a row. We only had two weeks because Jake Roberts, you'd mentioned him. Jake had, had gone into one of his uh, uh, stints at rehab. Uh, and uh, so he was AWOL and, and they brought Bruno in and just, he just said, don't pull my hair. I said, don't worry. I've worked with Killer Kowalski. It's all Kowalski said, don't pull my hair. <laughs> Because they both wore two, they wore two pants. Oh, I see. I, I kept thinking, uh, what, yeah. what does that mean right now? So they didn't want to actually physically lose their. Yeah, okay, I got gotcha. you. Let me understood. tell you. Let me tell you what I do with Kowalski. I would, I would take my hand and I would start in the middle of his back and I would tiptoe like a spider until I got <laughs> almost, almost to his neck and he'd snatch the heck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch my hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Too funny. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, I'll, I'll tell you guys another good one I, I did. And I didn't like doing it. I, I, but, you know, you, you just, you got to take care of yourself out there. I was in the ring in uh, Houston. Nick Kozak was the uh, referee, and Nick Kozak was, you know, one of them old timers and, and up there doing it, had been reduced to pulling the ring and refereeing. And, so I'm over there and I'm hitting on Jimmy Snooker, bam, bam. And I got Snook on the ropes and I'm going to bring him in the hard way. And uh, I pound him across the chest. I go for the next one. Kozak hooks my arm. So, you know, I'm not ready for it. And I almost tore my rotator cuff. Hmm. So I, I looked at him. I said, don't do that again. So I got Snook in. And I told Snook, I said, I'm going to get this mf <laughs> So I went down and covered Snooker, and Kozak went down one, two, and I raised up, and Kozak would stand up, and I went right. I didn't stand up. I just raised up, and Kozak stood up, and I went right back down. I, I had him seesawing for about three or four of them counts till he got out of breath. Then when he got up the last time, I ankle hooked him with my hand, and I snatched his leg and took him right back on his ass. <laughs> and when we, when we got in the locker room, I said, Nick, don't ever touch me again out there. Your job is not to grab me. I said, I had a spot with Snooker. We've been doing it every night for six months. Don't touch me. <laughs> you know, I, he just wanted to be involved. And sure, some sure. of the referee, some of the referees like that. I don't know if, if uh, Don, you ran across him and all them guys. Uh, uh, what was his name? He had a wrestling school and trained guys up there. And he was bad about that too. He wanted to get involved. Hmm. He wanted to be the star of the show. Oh, yeah. Well, the referee is just supposed to be, I mean, the referee is there. He's just to, there to do his job no, because all the wrestlers know exactly how to use the referee. They just, they do what Eddie, they're supposed Eddie, to. Eddie Sharkey, that was his name. Yeah. Eddie Sharkey trained a lot of guys. Tra well, he half assed trained guys. I mean, he had the road wars. I don't know if he, he could train them, but to, he put them out there and, they all they did was pound on people for about five years so they finally learned how to work so <laughs> you know those are guys that made a lot of money in japan too yeah they made a lot, they were, a lot of money they, they were like they were like kiss i mean that they, they were take off a kiss yeah. when they, when they yeah. came on board it was it was a, such a novelty that they they, had. they 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 beat up people so bad in atlanta that they would pay the job boys 50 bucks uh but if the job boys saw they were wrestling with uh against the road wars on a tv match they wouldn't go out. They said they, they packed their bag and leave. So if they were running out of guys to work with, they had to up to pay to start paying them 75 and 100 to go out and take a beating from the road warriors. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. Yeah, it was really something. Uh, well, 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 Wayne, what, what kind of things are you up to today? What, what's, uh... you know, I just, I go out and do these autograph signings and, uh, that's it. I do the comic cons. I got over, I had a long haul on the, uh, on the dead gum COVID last January 1st, I got it January 2nd, I suppose it was. And, and, uh, and, uh, I stayed sick for about 45 days, 50 days until I could, I finally got up and started moving around. I lost 60 pounds. I have overcome it. I don't know what, you know, what's going to happen in the long run, but I had a really bad case of it and, uh, I fought through it and made it and, I'm doing these comic cons. I'm going to go out to WrestleCon at WrestleMania in LA uh, next Thursday and do that. Like the signing we did in Ohio. Okay. I do those, those signings and, and that's it. Uh, I would like to get in the ring one time every year and try to get 50 years, but 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You, well, you I mean, always it, want you, you never want to quit, but <laughs> well, no, no, I, that's that, 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 that is one of the hard things is when does when does one walk away and still have you know uh, dignity or whatever to their to their career, you know. And and that's that's the thing. I don't want to I always said I'm never I'm not gonna be rolled out of the arena in a wheelchair. When I leave, I'm gonna walk away from the business on my own. And so far I've been able to do that. And I'm not gonna go up there and be an embarrassment to the fans and to myself. And uh, I see some guys that hang on too long and, you know, it's no big deal. Cause I mean, just it, one wrong move out there, either you slip or you fall or some young kid falls on you and it's over, it's over. And yes. forget about it. I don't, yeah. I don't, I have no desire to, for that you know to be a cheerleader and stand on the corner and tell the young kids that's the way boy go get them go get them son uh, i'm a good cheerleader <laughs> yeah 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 no well i mean if, if someone wants to try to get in touch with you do you have any kind of like social medias or an email yeah, address that, that... you know i i do that uh that twitter thing and then the facebook so i'm easy to find and of course you know wikipedia they wikipedia's got everything honky tonk is that what they do they yeah they, that's they can find me yeah yeah, okay. I'm easy to find. Easy to find. Not hard to find at all. I can't find you when you come from Michigan out here, though. And well, I, and I, I thought, and I thought Don was way down in Sierra Vista, but he's not too far from me. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm in Gilbert. You're in Gilbert. Don? Yeah, yeah. Well. I've been up here on the, I've been up here on the corner of uh, by the Superstition uh, Golf Course for almost thirty years now. Wow. <laughs> I, yeah you're you're not that far away I, in fact i was down in pinnell county i've uh, been down there looking for horse property for my daughter yeah she's i told you she's a veterinarian she's wanting to get into you know horses and stuff like that and about the only place to find any horse property now is that you got to get out and you got to get out in the woods it's not in, it, it's not in town i got two acres and a big house for sale got a barn and a garage. <laughs> <laughs> well what are you doing you're going to downsize yep Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So how's well, the old back doing? Back's doing a lot better now, I'll tell you, partner. We uh, Dan and I, you know, we were down there uh, a year and a half, two years ago, got that stem cells, you know, and then uh, I did it again here a couple months ago, and uh, it just it feels feels a lot different because uh, I, I had a couple years ago when I went down there to Columbia, I had a guy pushed me in with a wheelchair and I walked out of there, you know, that, that the same day. And, and, uh, it, it takes a long, you know, it's, it's up and down, up and down. And, uh, but eventually it, it got up and stayed up and leveled out. And I, I, I can, I can walk now. I can, I can work out now. I can ride my horse, you know, I can play my bulldog, you know, so everything is working great. Yeah, I was watching one of those Hannibal things with you a couple of years ago, and he had gotten you when you were in the hospital, and uh, it was like, Hannibal, why didn't you just wait a day or two till the man could get up and sit in a chair? <laughs> he, you were laying there all hooked up to all this stuff. and, <laughs> and yeah, uh, I, was, I was hurting, yeah. I was hurting. Did, did they put the uh, steel rod down your back and all that stuff? Yes, sir. They, they, I, they did that in... Uh... 2011 and then i broke it a couple of times and that's that's where the problems go. yeah yeah actually when he almost severed his spinal cord in, in the process of breaking the, the uh, metal rods right there so he's got to be a good boy now okay it's what he has to be and that's that's hard for don to be <laughs> yeah you know hogan he his he had his uh metal rod to, they put it in and he had some problem with it and they took it out and they put it back in and it broke and he had to go back again that old boy's in bad shape. I mean, yeah, he's not going to be good at all. I, yes. I haven't talked to him, but I've, I've guys have told me that he can only stand up for just a few minutes and then that's it. He's got to go sit down or be on a walker. Yeah. That's, that's how I've been, you know, for 10 shit, 10 years and then got that stem cells that makes a hell of a difference. You know, it really does. Uh, Kevin Nash told me that he had that, stem cell stuff many many years ago when it first when they first started doing it he, he went down there and had it done wherever you guys went mm -hmm. and uh he said it was worked a miracle for him yeah yeah you know i mean so you, it doesn't do exactly what 
you're expecting it. You know, you, you want to come out and jump over, jump a fence, jump a car, you know, what <laughs> but, uh, you know, it takes a while. It takes a while. And then, then you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. They, so- they, they, yeah, they say that uh, after you get the stem cells that uh, somewhere within that, say six to nine month range is when you see the biggest uh, development of uh you should see the biggest gains at, at that point that all the way up to the first year and then whatever uh, happens within that first year, that's probably about all you're going to get out of it. And then uh, it's just like anything else, you know, maybe, maybe if the other few years on the road, you might want to get another uh, set of stem cell uh, injections or an IV. I'm uh, working with uh, in, inside of Arizona, the Mesa, Arizona area is the only stem cell bank in the United States. I don't know if you know this or not. And that's actually one of the, the groups that I'm working with because there's state, uh, other modalities I'm working with in terms of health and, and wellness. Because I'm a big advocate for uh, not only just stem cells, but they have these, uh, it's called the insula chair, hyperbaric chambers, but then the ECP machines. So there's several different things that you can do that will add quality of life and add, add additional years to your life. So it's kind of going, well, when you start getting to a certain extent, it's kind of going, um, I want to get a few more years out of, out of this whole body if I can. Yeah, you know? I, didn't, uh, I didn't realize how uh, life can just be gone. It's when you lay there in the bed and you don't wake up. I didn't wake up for like 10 days. And and uh, then when you do was that through up, your, Was that through your COVID? That, when, COVID, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, wow. I mean, I didn't eat or drink uh, anything for i don't know for a long time i didn't have any smell any taste no appetite nothing and then when i was able to get up i was so dizzy i had to take baby steps and hold the wall and oh, it was a mess so anyway I, I always joked and made a joke about it i still do if i catch it i'm gonna catch it at walmart because i go to walmart every day when you call me earlier today i just left home i thought we were doing this earlier and i waited around i said heck i'm gonna run to the walmart and so when you called, I was at the Walmart. Uh, but then when I got over it and I was able to drive again, I didn't drive a car or anything for about three months because I was dizzy. First place I went was Walmart. And I, my daughter said, Dad, why'd you go to Walmart? And I said, if I catch it again, I'm going to catch it at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I go there sometimes just walk around just to give me something to do, you know. I'm like, okay, I'll go walk. But I'm not the only guy that does that, you know. And, well, he did it. Uh, remember Glenn Campbell, the country music singer? Yeah. When, 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 wherever, whatever town he was in, he would have the promoter pick him up, take him to the Walmart, drop him off, pick him up two hours later. He just put a baseball cap on and walked around, just walked around Walmart, looked at stuff. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's a, never freak, heard that. it's it's a it's a freak show anyway at Walmart, so it's fun to go watch. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's more of a freak show <laughs> later at night, though. It's a freak show. I mean, when you see some of these videos, uh, the people of Walmart, especially at nighttime, wow, that's it's all true. Crazy. It's all true. I, I can testify to that. But I go and I'm over here by Mesa. I'm right when you mentioned Mesa. I'm I'm, I'm across the streets, Mesa, and my Walmart's here in Mesa. So I get to Mesa crowd, so it's a little bit different, you know. Well, have you, okay, have you ever donned any of your jumpsuits late at night while visiting the Walmart yourself? No, uh, no, no, I haven't. Uh, okay. I, I, I never, I haven't gone that far yet. The, 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 the gimmick hasn't overtaken the man yet. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Your, your sanity is still there. That's, that's good to hear. Because like I said, we're yeah. in our, our interview there. Yeah. We're talking about some of the people, they, they've lived the gimmick for so long, they start they start actually becoming the character. No, so. I, I, I told you I had a five-year plan and I would go back to, I would be retired from teaching and coaching. I'd probably be retired from college coaching by now because a lot of my friends went into uh, college coaching and, you know, I would have had a nice little uh, retirement and, uh, but heck, I chose another direction and, you know, it is what it is. But if you get out here, Dan, we'll, we'll get in the car and we'll run down and see Don. I'd like to meet him in person. Yeah. No, that, we'll, we'll, that, definitely, that's a that's a plan. We'll definitely do that. Well, I I, I don't want to tie up any more longer there, uh, Don. Unless you got any other questions, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of put a wrap to this because I think we've had. I, I've enjoyed tonight's interview. This was probably one of the easiest one, the funnest one I've had <laughs> in, a, in a long time. Yeah. But, well, I've, I've enjoyed it. It was good talking to both of you guys. I I, I just uh, seeing you the other day brought back so many memories of, of you and I and 
and everything. We've always been pretty good friends, I thought, and uh, it, it'll continue on. Yes, it will. Well, again, that that uh, well, Tony, that concludes another uh, episode of Toxic Masculinity. If we happen to offend or defend, well, put your big boy pants on because that's what we are. We're real men talking about manly kind of things. And as I said before, if you don't like it, you have the option of changing the channel. We still live in America where you have freedom of choice. Really want to thank A.K. White Barris the honky-tonk man for being with us tonight and just had a chance to walk through his illustrious career and just to learn even some new things about him that I had never known before. So honky-tonk man, Wayne Ferris, I want to thank you for thank being you, here sir. tonight. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Yes, All right. You take care, Wayne. Thank you for watching another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. You better like, subscribe, and share or I'm going to come to your house.